Greetings to all physics enthusiasts and fans of physical experiments. My name is Andrei Shchetnikov, and in today's video, we will be exploring the nature of color, the mechanisms behind our color vision, and the fascinating mathematics that enable us to combine and subtract colors in order to generate new hues. The history of the physical study of color begins with Newton's experiments, where he used a prism to break down white sunlight into the colors of the rainbow, or spectral colors. He also discovered that these colors are pure in the sense that with another prism, it is impossible to break down any of these colors into other colors. They remain distinct on their own. To reproduce Newton's experiment, I will utilize an aquarium that is filled with water as a prism. This flashlight will function as the origin of white light, with two slits positioned behind it to generate a narrow beam of light. And at this moment, I am turning on the flashlight, and in order to see the image on the screen clearly, it is preferable to turn off the light source. And here we observe on the screen all the colors of the rainbow smoothly transitioning from one to another. Red, orange, a wide yellow band, a slim green one, blue, indigo, and violet. An alternative approach to obtain spectral colors is by using a compact disc and directing a beam of light from a flashlight onto it. And of course, this experiment is best conducted in the dark. This time, we utilize light diffraction rather than light dispersion on a diffraction grating. And we see the colors of the rainbow again, but for some reason the green band has widened and the yellow band is invisible. Although I utilize the identical light source in both experiments, it is crucial to comprehend that in both experiments, white light is being divided into its constituent components with varying wavelengths. And these components differ from each other only quantitatively in terms of wavelength. And the colors we perceive visually appear qualitatively different to us because blue is completely unlike green, and green is entirely different from yellow and red. At this moment, we need to shift our focus to our color vision, and I will hand it over to Alexi, who will take over from here. I'll start by mentioning that the retina of the eye contains two types of light-sensitive cells, rods and cones. There are roughly around 100 million rods and approximately about 6 million cones. However, it is the cones that are responsible for color perception, and they exclusively function under adequate lighting conditions. In twilight and darkness, only the rods work, which is why we cannot distinguish colors at night and in dim light. As the well-known saying goes, at night, all cats are gray. Now, I will talk about the three-component theory of color vision, initially proposed by Thomas Young in the early 19th century, and later developed and substantiated by Hermann von Helmholtz. According to this theory, the retina of our eye comprises three types of cones, and they react to the wavelength of light in one of three overlapping regions of the spectrum, blue, green, and red. Each cone sends its signal to the brain, and the brain processes these signals and tells itself something like this. The blue signal from this area of the retina is weak, while the green and red signals are equally strong, so here I see the color yellow. And we can conduct a classic experiment immediately. Here I have a source with three LEDs already installed and ready for use, red, green, and blue. And now, I will proceed to activate two of them, namely the green one and the red one. And we see that where the beams of light overlap, a yellow color is produced. Although there is no spectral yellow present in this situation, our brain is able to perceive the combination of spectral green and spectral red as the color yellow. Now, let us proceed to turn off the red LED. Additionally, we will proceed to turn on the blue LED. And at the intersection, we observe the blue color, which professionals commonly refer to as cyan. Now let's deactivate the green color and activate the red color. At the intersection, we obtain a color that is known as magenta. At this moment, if you switch on all three light-emitting diodes simultaneously in the middle position, we will be able to observe a plain white coloration. Now let's engage in playing with shadows. When I position the ball in the yellow region, it casts shadows that are red and green in color. 
In the cyan area, there are shades of green and blue. In the magenta region, there are shades of red and blue. And when I position the ball in the white region, it creates shadows of various colors. Alexi, the experiments you presented were absolutely fantastic, but I have a couple of questions for you. And the first question is this. When filming, the colors I saw with my own eyes were actually completely different from the colors produced in the video we showed to viewers. No, certainly not. The camera sensor is completely different from the retina of the eye. When shooting, for example, in bright lighting conditions, the blue color appears as violet. Here are the blue flowers I captured exactly like this. So everything also depends on the shooting conditions, and there is definitely no perfect match. But there is some correspondence, right? Well, OK. Yes, I have an additional question as well. You were explaining to us about the three-component model of color vision. Is it truly certain that there are indeed three types of cones present in the eye, as we have previously described and explained in detail? However, in this particular field, discussions and debates are currently ongoing regarding this specific topic. There exist alternative models and a link to an excellent review by Ruslan Ivanovich Korovenkov on the history of color vision is attached below the video clip for further reference. So to say that this is absolutely true is not possible. However, it is such a convenient model that allows us to develop different technical devices and gadgets. Color TVs, displays, matrices, cameras, video cameras, and photo cameras for capturing and viewing images. And all of them are functioning, correct? Well, naturally, at this point, we must specifically focus on and discuss it immediately. And as usual, I will begin with an experiment. I will grab this camera right here, switch it to macro mode, and capture a photo of the inscription on the monitor screen. The display that appears white from a distance is actually composed of red, green, and blue pixels that are pushed to the upper limit of their brightness levels. In the red letter, only red pixels are included. In the green one, only green ones. In the blue one, only blue. In the cyan letter, green and blue pixels are lit up, magenta is created by red and blue pixels, and yellow color is formed by red and green. Pixels of all three colors create shades of gray, but they lack brightness as they do not shine brightly. In the color black, all pixels are completely turned off. This color blending scheme is commonly known as RGB, which is an abbreviation for the first letters of the primary colors red, green, and blue. And for each primary color in computer implementation, there are 256 shades of brightness in the eighth power. By combining these shades, we are able to achieve an approximate total of 16 million different color tones, providing a wide range of options. Now we can input coordinates in a three-dimensional color space. Red color has coordinates 255, 0, 0, green 0, 255, 0, blue 0, 0, 255. By combining primary colors in pairs, we obtain yellow, cyan, and magenta. Combining all three primary colors leads to the creation of the color white. Additionally, the color black is situated at the origin coordinates of 0, 0, 0. We have knowledge of the coordinates of the primary colors in the top row, and the pipette tool visually displays them to us. Now let's see what coordinates the colors in the bottom row have. The coordinates of this brown are 102, 51, 51. In it, red is set to 40% of its full brightness, while green and blue are set to 20%. The coordinates of this orange are 255, 102, 0. It's as if 60% green emerged from pure yellow. Coordinates of this lavender, 204, 102, 204. Brightness percentages can be calculated by you. And at this point, we have already covered the RGB color system. But it is important to understand that the artificial yellow produced in this system is not the same as the spectral yellow. Instead, it is composed of a combination of red and green, which results in a similar but not identical shade of yellow. During the demonstration when we displayed spectral yellow on the screen, it was, in fact, a blend of red and green, and in this sense, it lost its spectral characteristics. Therefore, it can no longer be considered purely spectral in nature. Up to now, we have been dealing with objects that emit light themselves. However, 
Most objects do not emit light themselves, but rather scatter light from external sources. This is the book. It's red. It's lit by white light, but the dye in it absorbs most of the spectrum except for the red part. The book's color is due to the absorption of all colors except red by the dye. Now let's examine this jar. The water inside it has a blue color. The light from the white screen positioned behind the jar illuminates it. But the dye contained in the jar absorbs all wavelengths of light except for the blue portion of the spectrum. Now I will position the book behind the bench, ensuring it is placed at a certain distance from the bench itself. The red light emitted from the book falls on the jar, but the jar only allows the blue portion of the spectrum to pass through, not the red light. And that is the reason why the book appears black to you. I have reactivated the three color source and will be inserting cards of different colors into it to observe the effects. Let us commence with the color red. When it comes to red, it appears as the color red, and the identical principle holds true for magenta and yellow light. However, when it is in the color green, it takes on a dark appearance, whereas in the color blue, it takes on an almost black appearance. Now the green card. When it is in green and yellow, its color gives the impression of being green. When it comes to the colors red and blue, the combination appears to be almost black. I have a blue card. And it is evident what we will have at this particular moment. In blue it is blue, but in red and green it is practically black in color. We have examined the primary colors, and now let's shift our attention to yellow. In the case of yellow, it is certainly yellow. When displayed in green and cyan, it appears green. Conversely, when shown in red and magenta, it takes on a red hue. And only in the blue light does the card appear black. Here we can observe a depiction of seven areas that we have just witnessed, along with the corresponding primary colors that originate from each of these areas we have explored. Now visualize that we position a substantial red card underneath all of this in our imagination. It has the ability to absorb all colors except for red. As a result, when it is applied to a painting, only a prominent red circle will be retained. The identical event will occur with the remaining primary colors, specifically blue and green. I will not even display it. Now let us position a big yellow card underneath it in order to enhance the visual impact. She exclusively absorbs the blue color. It will completely disappear, leaving us with precisely three distinct areas. Red, green and yellow. At this moment, I will proceed to conduct an experiment utilizing these colored transparent films for my research study. We examine the color patches displayed on the screen and place a red filter over the lens. Only the red circle remains. The green filter solely leaves only the green circle behind, with no other colors present. Blue filter, blue circle. And now a yellow filter. And we have two circles with yellow intersection in precise accordance with the predictions that were made based on the theory's principles. Subsequent to the experiments demonstrated by Alexei, we can proceed to a color model that is based not on addition, but on the subtraction of colors as its fundamental principle. In this model, the primary colors are cyan, magenta, and yellow, and the model is referred to as CMI, which stands for the first letters of the colors. This diagram visually represents which two primary colors from the RGB set pass through their corresponding filters in the color filter system. Now let's overlap them, and only one color, whether it is red, green, or blue, will pass through each pair of overlapping areas of the colors. And where all three films overlap, there will be no light passing through, and this overlapping area will appear black. And now we will witness firsthand how this color system is employed in the intricate process of multicolor printing. And for this purpose, I will once again utilize a camera to capture and document a small fragment of a vibrant color illustration through photography. At this moment, we are able to see a grid, which is commonly referred to as a raster, in the field of printing. Let us zoom in even further, and now we are able to observe dots that represent the primary colors of the CMY system, cyan, magenta, and yellow, arranged in a specific order. In some places they are larger in size, while in others they are smaller or completely disappear. And it is the arrangement of these dots that gives rise to the entire spectrum of colors that we perceive in the illustration. And this variety arises due to the overlapping of spots, where the spots overlap with each other, resulting in a mixing of colors. As an illustration, in situations where cyan and magenta overlap as a result of the white light that is falling onto the paper, only the color blue has the ability to emerge back again. And also, observant viewers might have noticed that besides these three colored spots, there is a fourth one, simply black, with printer's soot. This action is performed to enhance the contrast. Presently, it is the moment for our customary concluding inquiry that we always ask at the end. 
and those who closely watch this video will make an effort to provide an answer to it. Perhaps all of us in our childhood days mixed different paints and had the hope that if we combine red, green, and blue, we would end up with something white. However, instead of achieving that, we are left with this kind of messy situation. And the question arises, why does this phenomenon happen? Share your thoughts on this matter in the comments section of this video on YouTube.